So, this happened in 2011, so the exact dialogue may have escaped my memory a bit, but this situation is something I'll never forget. Also, AIM was still pretty active during this time, and so was video chatting. Remember this for later. I was on an online dating site and I was talking to this guy. I was 31 at the time and he was 28. We talked for about 6 weeks before I gave him my phone number and we took it offline to calling and texting for another couple of weeks. Two months after our initial chat, we were texting and he told me that he was out having a few beers at a bar near my house. He asked what I was doing and asked if I wanted to come out, but I had a very long day at work and didn't feel like going out to a bar. I invited him over to my place after he finished at the bar, and he accepted. I figured I would be okay since I do keep firearms for protection, and I know how to defend myself if need be. I also had a webcam. I took a shower so I wouldn't smell like a water buffalo on a hot day, put on some makeup, and got dressed to wait. He then called and said he was outside my house. I clicked record on my computer's webcam program and turned off my monitor and went to let him in. It's around 10 p.m. and he comes in and we go back to my bedroom because my living room was being remodeled. We're sitting on the bed chatting for about an hour, talking about everything under the sun. The conversation flowed. He was very handsome and so easy to be comfortable with. We got on the subject of firearms and I showed him mine. About 15 minutes later, he asks for some water, so I go to the kitchen and get him a bottle. When I come back, he said he got a phone call and had to leave. After he left, I looked on my nightstand and noticed my weapon was gone. I looked everywhere for it, thinking I'd put it down somewhere else. No, not there. I then played back the recording from my webcam program, and sure enough, it shows him grabbing it and putting it in his hoodie. I was terrified at that point. He knew where I lived. He had my firearm and... He left his phone on my bed. Right then, his phone rings and I answer it. I come to find out. He's married. His wife was calling him, wondering where he was. I told her everything, including the fact that he stole my firearm and I had video evidence and was calling the police on him. Next thing I know, he's banging on my door, my firearm in his hand, asking for his phone. I need my phone. Give me my phone, he says. Take the clip out of my firearm. Empty the chamber. Throw the clip into the bushes, the one in the chamber across the road, and put it on the ground, I tell him. No, give me my phone, he retorts. I'm on the phone with your wife at the moment, and I have you on video stealing from me, I tell him. I put his wife on speaker. She unleashes a whole bunch of expletives. He runs and gets in his car, then comes back. I threw your gun in the ditch, he tells me. At this point, I make him empty his pockets, take his pants off, take his hoodie off, and show me that he doesn't have my firearm on him. He proceeds to tell me that I don't know how hard it is for him, being a felon, not being allowed to own a firearm ever because of a mistake he made. The mistake, you may ask, domestic violence, involving a firearm. We get up the road. He tells me my firearm is there in the ditch. Then, I realize the situation I'm in. I can get out of the car and go get it, leaving him to do whatever to me, if he chose. He was six foot four, 225 pounds, and me on the other hand, five foot three, 135 pounds, or I could make him go get it. Taking the chance of him seriously hurting me, I took that chance since I was on the phone with his wife and my phone with 911. He retrieves my firearm, brings it back to the car, and I drive back to my house and wait on the police. I get out of the car and he gets in the driver's seat. I'm still on the phone with the police. I walk around the back of his car to get the license plate number and he just puts his car in reverse, hits me, and takes off. They found him later that evening. He still had the clip 
and the one in the chamber in his pocket, so now he's enjoying present time. I'm so glad I never have to meet this person again. I live in a major US city. I made the move here during the pandemic, and as there wasn't much going on, I made the habit of having some beers and food at the local lakeside park near me. You see and meet all different types of people. At the beginning of this year, on a day that wasn't too wet or cold, I made my way down to the lake. I brought a sandwich, a couple of beers, and was listening to a true crime podcast. I found a little group of trees, pretty dry and pretty out of the way. I was hard to spot, so when I noticed this man walking towards me, I knew he was going to ask for a cigarette. Even from a distance, he seemed weird, so I thought, I'll give this asshole a cigarette so he doesn't get pissy about it and let him be on his way. Sure enough, this guy offers me some Doritos in exchange for a cigarette. I say no to the chips, but tell him he can just have one, just to get him away and be done with it. He introduces himself, and we launch into a meandering conversation. He's weird, and I can't shake the feeling that this guy is off, but the conversation itself is pretty normal. I just don't want to get this guy angry when there's not a lot of people around. Two hours later, after talking about all sorts of stuff, I finally excuse myself and leave. Less than a week later, I'm having a post-work beer at a bar when I hear a voice. I look up, and there he is. I tell myself, screw this. If this guy tries to corner me again to talk, I'm going straight to the bartender to get him off my back. I'm here to chill, not chat. It does not get to that as he whines about the TV, the music, the price, to the point the bartender kicks him out before he notices me. When he did get angry, he really got aggressive and was ready to fight. I knew it. A few weeks later, the bartender tells me a story. He'd run into an old-time regular who seemed frazzled. He explained that while walking to the park, he saw some guy who recognized him. Hey, you're Chris, the regular from the bar back in the day. The regular denied it, said he didn't know what this guy was talking about. Why? Because turns out, 30 years ago, this asshole abducted a woman, kept her alive long enough to make sure she told him the right information to make ATM withdrawals with her bank card, killed her, and dumped the body. He got caught because he was driving her car around, with her blood all over the back seat, making maximum daily withdrawals from the same ATM every day. When he got caught, he bragged about how they'd never find the body. They never have. The bartender and I were able to corroborate this story because we found some articles online about the murder, mugshot and all. The guy looked 30 years younger, sure, but it was him. New Year's Eve, five years ago, I went away for the night with my two best friends and one of their moms. I was home for the holidays from college and my friend Sarah invited me to go to Palm Springs to celebrate New Year's with her mom and our friend Rachel. I didn't have any other plans, so I decided to go with them. We went to a cool city about an hour from where we live that is big on shopping and resorts. We planned to have a pretty calm night, watch the ball drop at a block party thing downtown, have a few drinks at a bar. Since we're on the west coast, the ball drop is at 9, so at around 8, we ventured from our hotel, walking to the block party about a mile away. On the way, we passed a very lively bar. We decided to stop by and spend about 15 minutes dancing, but we didn't get any drinks. 
It was a gay bar, and Sarah and Rachel being gay, they were stoked on it and wanted to come back after the ball drop, even though it was about 90% men there. We continue on to the block party, get some dinner and a glass of champagne. The ball dropped and they had a DJ, so we spent about an hour there dancing. After we got tired of it, we decided to head back to the bar and hang out there until midnight. Once we get there, Sarah's mom pays for a drink for each of us, but leaves us soon after that because she was tired. It's about 10.30 at this point and Sarah, Rachel, and I are enjoying our drinks and having fun dancing. Rachel tried some of my drink since it was one she hadn't had before. I constantly have my guard up when drinking in public, and I felt safe at this bar because it was 90% gay men, who I thought would not have an interest in me. I went back to the bar to get a second drink, and that's the last thing I remember. The rest I've gathered from Sarah and Rachel... Almost immediately after getting my second drink, I asked Rachel to go to the bathroom with me because I wasn't feeling well, even though I was completely fine ten minutes before. Once in the bathroom, I just collapsed on the floor, and I was almost unresponsive. Rachel, now worried, somehow drags my half-lifeless body out to where Sarah was waiting for us. Security, seeing my condition and assuming I was wasted, asked us to leave. Sarah and Rachel decide to take me back to the hotel, about half a mile away. By this point, I was unconscious, and there were barely sounds escaping from my mouth. They saw someone leave the bar at the same time as us, who was walking near us, but they were preoccupied with trying to keep my lifeless body off the ground. At one point, I threw up all over myself, the both of them, the sidewalk, and all that. The next part of the story we had to get from Sarah, and Rachel doesn't have memory of this, still struggling to carry me. The man they saw leave the bar approached them. He was hitting on Rachel, trying to get her to grab a drink with him. She was very agitated and told him to leave, that her friend needed help right now. He didn't take no for an answer and continued to follow us down the street asking if they wanted to get drinks with him, if he can help carry me and such. A middle-aged woman witnessing this came up and told the man off, something along the lines of, stop harassing these young women or I'm going to call the police. He left after that. Next, by some miracle, an EMT and his wife enjoying the holiday ran into us on the street. He checked me out to make sure something wasn't majorly wrong and then he carried me the rest of the way to the hotel and into the room, since my friends could barely hold me up. They thanked him profusely, and him and his wife left. This is where Rachel's memory kicks back in. Five minutes later, they get a knock on the door, and it's the EMT and his wife again. They came to let us know that a man followed us to the hotel, and that they just saw him hop the gate and start to make his way to our room. My friends called hotel security, but they were unable to find him. My friends didn't get a glimpse of him, but I'm sure it was the man from earlier. I spent the rest of the night vomiting everything in my body and dry heaving after that. I woke up the next morning in a pile of pillows and blankets on the bathroom floor. My last memory was at the bar getting a second drink, and my friends filled me in on everything that happened. Feeling like shit, I thought I must have drank way too much, but I'd never blacked out before in my life, and the amount of drinks I had didn't add up to me being completely unconscious. It was two in two hours. We decided my first drink had to have been drugged, since Rachel had some memory of it and had no memory of our walk home, even though she was fully functional. I'm sure that the man that was talking to Rachel and then followed us back was the one that slipped something into my drink. To this day, I don't really know how I could have been slipped something. I got my drink from the bar and never set it down. My best guess was that it was already in the cup. Thankfully, 
I had good friends and kind strangers protecting me that night. It keeps me up at night, thinking what could have happened under different circumstances. This happened one summer when I was 12 to 13. It was before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we would stay at four hours north of our home. My father could not attend due to the fact that he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin. It was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent that all arched around in a C shape with parking spots in front and at the front of the line of cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed. In the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out, even though it was August and this area, although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. The gentleman that worked at the front desk came out to greet us. I didn't pay too much attention, due to the fact I was 12 and excited for the fun outdoors adventure that my mother and I were going to have. Well, I remember him giving my mom the keys and saying, the bathroom window is broken and does not close all the way or lock. We thought it was strange, but kind of shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back in at dusk, and we went to bed. The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get in the truck. It would not start. Strange. I will admit, at the time, it was a newer SUV. I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and saying, Oh, your truck is broke. Too bad. Let me call someone. My mom insisted she could call someone and went into his office and used the phone. She called someone to come and fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, Did you guys have any problems with the power last night? My mom and I shook our heads, confused. Oh, well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out. All you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mom where the breaker was. After getting the truck fixed, having another day of adventure, we came back, ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching television, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. My mom grabbed a flashlight she'd packed, and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anyone would be. We got back in bed, and about ten minutes later, the power went out again. My mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day. About two years ago, me and my family moved from New Jersey to Florida for a fresh start. Before I start my encounter, I want to iterate my mental state at the time because it contributes to how I acted at the time of this story. So the night of the move, my mother got a call from a close family friend. She'd just become pregnant and it started to have complications and feared she lost the baby. My mother, being the awesome woman she is, went over to help and watch her young son and calm our friend down and told her to go to the hospital to be sure and check her. She and her husband rushed to the hospital and luckily she hadn't lost the baby. But it wasn't until one in the morning until my mother got back and I was still up waiting for her to get back. So yes, we were dead tired the next day when we had to pack everything up for the long trip to our new home in Florida. While my father, who had slept through the whole ordeal the night before, was not. But that's just me bitching. Anyway, I'm driving with my mother, 
while my father is in another car. I'm not exactly happy about the move. So tired and upset, we continue with our trip. We've always driven from New Jersey to Florida for years and never had any really weird experiences out on the road. I'm not sure about my parents, but they've never talked about anything creepy in my 22 years I've been alive. And I've traveled with them. And trust me, they love to tell stories. And I do too. So when this happened, I was wholly unprepared for it. It certainly didn't help with what happened the night before either. So, we stop at one of the many stops on our way to Florida. And I think we were in the Carolinas or somewhere near there when we stopped. Now, if you've never traveled before by car, a rest stop is a place kind of like a civic center or rest area. These places are for travelers who either need a minute to stretch, go to the bathroom, or a place where they can safely rest for the night in their cars. These places are usually well lit and they have vending machines for anyone who needs a snack or drink. It was late maybe about nine at night, and we stopped to stretch our legs and go to the bathroom. I wanted a few snacks, so I asked my mother for some dollar bills. She gave them to me, and I entered the nice little enclosed area that contained the machines. So I'm standing there alone, picking what I want, when this woman comes in. She's a short, skinny older woman who's dressed nice with bleach blonde hair. When I glanced at her and smiled politely, she came right up to me and holds out her hand for a shake and introduces herself. Dumbfounded, I shake her hand back and stupidly told her my name. After that, she launches into this whole tale of woe about how she lost her wedding ring, had a head wound, and that her car was out of gas, and she needed some money and other things I can't honestly remember. And I'm just standing there, listening and trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. Now, you have to understand, this was literally the first time anyone had ever approached me at one of these stops. Mostly because I don't think I have the most friendly of faces for people to approach for help. Even though I'm a girl, I'm tall at around 5'5 five five to 5'6, five broad-shouldered, and I resemble my father who doesn't have the most welcoming of faces either, and acts it. But me, I'm a bleeding heart, and I never want to be rude to people. But in this situation, I would have been, if it hadn't been so out of the blue. When I'm in situations that are new to me, I tend to freeze up and can't think. I don't know how to act or what to do in situations I'm not expecting. As you can guess, I'm a big introvert and socially awkward, but I don't have a problem with telling people to fuck off. But in this situation, I'm outright panicking and just want to get away from this weird woman. And I want to say weird because of the head injury I mentioned. She didn't have one, not even a bruise. And she was talking so fast and non-stop, I couldn't even tell her no, I can't help, or even try to. For some reason, being polite was more important than getting the fuck away. So I'm standing there, exhausted to my bones, about to shove what little money I have at her so she just goes away when my mother walks in. My badass of a mother comes right in and says I can't do anything and tells me to come with her. The woman takes a step back and I realize just how close she was. I hadn't even noticed she was steadily coming closer as she was talking. She tells my mother how beautiful and nice I am, when in reality I look like a greasy mess because I don't care about my appearance when I take a road trip. My mother doesn't really respond and she has me by the arm, walking towards the bathroom, asking if I'm okay. The woman got out of there and goes the opposite direction of where she said her car was. Looking back on it all, at the time, I thought it was just weird, and I was certainly weirded out by it all. But I just thought whatever. But after listening to YouTube and reading Reddit posts of let's not meet in the such, I realized how lucky I was two years later that the situation hadn't escalated. I think the reason why she approached me was probably the dollar bills I mentioned earlier. 
They were folded and it looked like I had a lot on me, even though I had like six or seven dollars. And because it was probably obvious to her how tired I was and how much of an easy score she could have gotten in my tired, grumpy state. So if anyone reads this, I hope you aren't planning on traveling alone. But if you are, be careful of people, even completely normal looking ones. You can never be too careful especially due to all the people looking for an easy score. This happened in 2019. I no longer have contact with this person. When my husband and I lived in our first apartment together, I did not have a job. We had just moved to a new city and I had trouble finding anything. Naturally, I was at home because of this. Every day at the same time, I would walk my dog Remy. We would always walk the same route, in front of the leasing office across the street, by the basketball courts, and by the tennis courts before walking the rest of the property of the apartment complex. The first encounter I had with this guy gave me tons of red flags and I did report him to the leasing office because of his behavior. As I was walking Remy back home, this man who looks like he was in his 40s, glasses and gray hair, was walking from the basketball court to the sidewalk. I stopped with Remy because she was going to try and jump on him if he got close enough. He noticed us and asked, Is she aggressive? I told him, No, she'll just jump on you. And I know some people don't like dogs or dogs jumping on them. He looked me up and down, staring at my chest for a second. Then he asked if he could pet her. I said sure, because Remy's tail was going a million miles an hour. She was whining to meet a new person. He started to talk to me while he was petting Remy. I'm Joe. I just moved in across the street. What's your dog's name? I was nice to him even though I had a weird feeling while talking to him. This is Remy. I'm Megan. I live next to the groundskeeper with my fiancé. You'll like it here. The staff are awesome. The entire time I was talking, he was petting Remy and staring at my chest. Joe thanked me for letting him pet my dog and then turned around to leave. I was weirded out, but brushed it off. I told myself it was probably nothing. I walked Remy the rest of the way home, but I noticed that Joe had went into the entrance of his apartment building, but he was watching me walk home through the glass. I hightailed it the rest of the way to my apartment. It had freaked me out enough, so I called the leasing office and told them that Joe watched me walk home after meeting me, and that I was generally uncomfortable with him. I also had them come fix the blinds in our dining rooms, because I didn't want anyone looking inside our apartment. After I loaded myself into the car and drove myself to my mother-in-law's house, I stayed there until my now husband got home. Any time I walked Remy and eventually Peach, my other dog, Joe always was somehow outside when I was. He always tried to come talk to me or pet the dogs. Luckily, when I would walk Peach, she would growl at him. If I ever walked the dogs with my husband, he would never come talk to me. It was only if I was alone or with Remy. He would also start walking by the front of our apartment when my husband wasn't home. He would try to look through the sliding door to get a glimpse of me. My husband and I decided to move into a bigger apartment because we needed more space for the dogs and ourselves. The day I got the keys for our new apartment just down the street, I had another experience with Joe that made me call the cops. I was walking both of the dogs around the block so I could finish up some last minute packing. I saw Joe pull into the complex in his car. I stopped to let him go past me, but he waved me to cross the road. When I did cross, he pulled around really fast with his window already rolled down. Hey Megan, I was wondering, are you happy with your husband? If not, I can help you out. He looked me up and down and gave me a wink. I acted like I didn't hear him since I had headphones in. I immediately went inside and locked the door behind me. 
I called the leasing office and told them what happened. I also let them know I was going to call the cops and at least make a report because his behavior was freaking me out. I wanted to at least have it documented. I called a non-emergency line and an officer came out. I told him what happened that day and some of the creepy behavior Joe had before. The cop asked me, do you want me to give him a warning not to talk to you? I said yes. I thanked the officer for his time and he took my name and phone number down. He went to the leasing office to talk to the staff about the situation. About an hour later, the cop left. He gave me a call. He told me he's talked with the property manager of my apartment and he also ran Joe's license plate. He told me his name and told me that the leasing office said he has other complaints from other tenants on file. He also mentioned he didn't get a chance to talk to him because Joe was leaving as the cop arrived at the leasing office. I thanked him again for his time and finished packing. I decided to go to the leasing office to talk to the property manager so I could clear up anything just in case. When I got there, the manager told me that Joe had multiple reports just like the officer had told me. She also told me she was going to have our on-site officer stop and talk to him and encourage him not to talk to me or other female residents. I thanked her and went home to start moving little things until my husband got home. I went almost six months without another incident with Joe. We moved to the third floor and he didn't have any idea which apartment was us, so he wouldn't bother us. I also made it a point to have the dogs on a certain schedule, so I would never run into him if we were out. The last time Joe tried to talk to me, I turned around and walked away. I didn't let him get a word in. I did notice him harassing my neighbor outside while she was grilling one day. I told the leasing office about it just in case. A couple of months later, he moved out because they wouldn't let him re-sign his lease. That's the last I saw of Joe. I carried a stun gun with me when I walked the dogs or by myself because of him. I was fully prepared to shock his ass a couple of times if he ever got close after I called the cops on him. I grew up in a military family, and we were stationed overseas for this story. We weren't in France, but my mom and I went on a big girls trip with a bunch of our friends to Paris over winter break. We were only supposed to spend five days there. The first few days went fine and we all had a great time, but on one of the last days, all the moms got emailed that our flight back was cancelled due to snowstorms. We spent an afternoon hanging out in the Starbucks under the Louvre and trying to figure out travel plans to get back home to the other European country we were all living. Well, when the airlines rescheduled our flights, the several families were put on different flights over the next three days, but they scheduled me and my mom for different flights on different days. Yeah, a nine-year-old girl traveling alone wasn't going to work. The next flight they had available for us was a fourth day after everyone else. Our hotel room had bookings after we left, so my mom and I had to find another place to stay for some extra nights. Not a big deal, right? Well, when it came time for us to take a taxi to our next hotel room, us being the only family in Paris, the taxi driver gave us a weird look when he realized where he was taking us. Then he gave us a warning. Don't go out at night. I may have been nine, but I knew enough to know that meant bad people in danger. I don't remember my mom's reaction, but I'm sure it wasn't good. We got to the hotel, and it was nothing like what the hotel site had shown. They definitely lied on their site with stolen photos of a much better hotel. But my mom had already paid, and it was only for two nights. We were sure not to stay out too late and had no issues the first night. The last day went fine, actually. We went up to the Sacre Coeur Basilica and hung around there for most of the day. When evening came, we made sure to go back to the hotel room early. That's when bad things happened. When darkness fell, 
we started to hear a lot of people in the hotel lobby. We were only on the first floor and basically right above the lobby. The hotel was built in an old apartment type building for a European city space. We at first just turned on the French TV and tried to ignore it. Then there was pounding footsteps up the stairs and angry shouting in French. My mom definitely jumped at that and we had an uneasy feeling. Then the angry Frenchman started pounding on our door. We didn't speak French and most of what he was saying was slurred. We only caught things like, we know you're in there and we know you have them. I, being nine, had no idea what they were talking about. But obviously my mom and I were terrified. She told me quietly to not make any sounds. Whatever state the TV was in, we kept it that way to make it seem like the other room was empty. The banging on the door just kept going and going, and the shouting didn't stop. The front desk people should have heard us, in all honesty. If we could hear them downstairs, there's no way they didn't hear our door being assaulted. My mom called our dad, who was at home in our host country. We got him to try and call the French police as he speaks some French, but he couldn't get through. We were on our own. I slept with my clothes on and we had a suitcase prepped in case we needed to run somehow. I, being nine, late at night on a long trip, somehow managed to get some sleep because I was so tired. My mom didn't sleep the whole night. At some point, I got woken up by the door cracking. My mom said she'd never been so scared in her life. The angry Frenchman just kept going as they tried to break down our room door. The door didn't give though, somehow, and eventually at some point in the early morning, they left us alone. We left ASAP and went to the airport for the rest of the morning. I'm sure my mom reported the hotel on the booking sites and we slept at our flight gate until it was a reasonable time to be awake. We ended up getting promoted to first class after an apology for the problem with the scheduling, and after the harrowing experience of the past night, we definitely took it. It took years of telling this crazy story for my mom to tell me the hotel lobby was probably selling and doing drugs down below us, which is why no one responded. The staff were all too high to do anything, the angry Frenchmen were either so high they were imagining someone else was hiding in our room or their drugs were stashed in there and we didn't know about it. I have no idea how the door didn't break, but I'm so glad it didn't. It all started with a normal day at work. I worked at a small grocery store at the time, and my duties consisted of gathering shopping carts in the parking lot and bagging groceries, normal minimum wage stuff. It was rainy that morning, and of course, I was assigned to carts all day. About two hours into my shift, I saw a man rushing to get his groceries into the car. It was pouring. I ran over to him and started helping him with his bags. It's pouring, I said. Mind if I help you get out of the rain? Yes, thank you so much. As he was closing his trunk, he looked at me with a very surprised look on his face. He lowered his eyebrows, looked me up and down, and smirked. Are you a new hire? No, I've been here for a couple of months, I responded. Oh, you are very pretty, he said in a weirdly sensual tone. Thank you. Have a good day. I shut it down. I was not interested. As I was walking back to the store to hide until he left, I could feel him watching me while I walked away. Nevertheless, I continued to work, not really thinking about it. After my lunch, I was at the register bagging groceries, and I noticed the same man from earlier walk in. I pretended I didn't see him and just kept bagging. He came up to the register and got a single chocolate bar. I didn't give him a bag. He stands towering over me and says, Aren't you gonna bag my item? Oh, sorry. 
I didn't know you wanted a bag for one thing, I said. I put his chocolate bar in a bag and told him to have a good day. When are you off of work, sweetheart? Ah, oh, man, I'm not comfortable giving that information out, I said. He returned with, That's okay, you've been here, what? Five hours. You'll probably get off around six or seven, right? He smiled, winked at me, and walked away. Disgusted, I went to my manager and told her what happened. She told me not to work the lot anymore and to ask someone to walk me to my car. So by the end of my shift, I had a male co-worker walk me to my truck, and we scanned the parking lot, looking for this man's car. We didn't see him, so my co-worker went back inside, and I started my truck. I called my mom to tell her about what had happened, and once she answered, I left the parking lot. Literally, the second I turned onto the main road, I saw his car pull onto the road behind me. I told my mom I thought he was going to follow me, and she just told me to drive around a bit and try to lose him. I drove around for about 20 minutes, just going in circles around my town. I hit a red light, and he pulled up next to me and started yelling something to me out of his open window. I, of course, pretended he wasn't there, but I could still hear what he was saying. You would bear some good kids for me. You'd make a great slave for me, little lady. He then started being very explicit about what he was going to do to me if he caught me. I told my mom I was going to call 911, and if I wasn't home within an hour, then to call the police. While I was trying to dial 911, the man speeds ahead of my truck and starts brake checking me. Frantic. I wait for the closest intersection and turn up the block. My phone fell under my seat while I was turning, so I decided to go to the nearest open establishment and run in and hide and have someone else call 911. The closest open business I could find was a convenience store at a gas station. I pull in, park, and run for my life into the store. I tell the clerk what's happening. She takes me to the break room and locks me in there. While processing that I might have survived this ordeal, I hear the doors of the storefront start violently rattling. And before I knew it, the clerk was locking herself in the break room too. She was on the phone with the police, and they were on their way. We were silent, cowering in a dark room. I found myself feeling guilty for wrapping another woman into our worst fear. My thoughts were racing through what I said to him. Did I lead him on? No. I just told him to have a good day. Has he been following me for longer than tonight? How did he know what car I drive? Are the police going to get here in time? Are we going to die? Finally, the small room is illuminated with red and blue lights from the crack under the door. We hear a voice over the intercom telling us it's safe to come out. Shaking, the clerk takes out her keys and opens the door. We walk out and give our statements. After the police leave, I turn to my unexpected savior and profusely thank her. We cry, hug, and she walks me to my car. The next night, I went back and bought her some food in an Amazon gift card. I've been in a near-fatal car accident, ten feet away from a mountain lion in the wild and I'm a survivor of sexual assault. I can tell you, listener, with total honesty, I thought that was the end of my line. Thank you for listening. Stay aware, be cautious, and stay safe. I'm a 24-year-old male, and I do some freelance journalism outside of my university classes. The city I'm in has a population of about 170,000 people. About two weeks ago, a crash occurred near downtown, and I decided to go scope it out and see how newsworthy it was. The crash was on a two-lane street near the projects. I had a thought come across my head while driving there, thinking... Something weird is going to happen when I get there. And behold, 
As I was parking my car in the parking lot, close to the crash scene, a woman was standing there in the middle of the lot, gesturing me to park. I was like, oh, okay. She comes up to me and asked me to roll down the window. I cracked it open enough to talk. We had a strange conversation. Hey, Ola, how are you doing? Can you help me out with something here? I'm trying to get my clothes out of this trailer over there, but I can't see because it's too dark. Can I borrow a flashlight? I've been putting this off all day, she said. I don't know. I don't really carry one with me, I lied. You don't have a flashlight or anything I could borrow, or maybe something to get food to eat. Maybe I could borrow your phone flashlight. I can get my clothes then and bring it back to you. All I got is this, and she shows me a lighter and some light-up kid's toy. I can't. I'm trying to cover this news story here. I'm a journalist, I say to her. I'm sorry, I didn't know, but maybe you could walk with me so I won't go by myself. It's just right down there, she said, as she points behind a building that's a church and where the parking lot ends. I would, but I can't. I need to cover this, I reply. I'm so sorry, I thought you were a random person. I'm sorry. Have a good night. It was nice meeting you. She walks away from my car and goes up to a guy I noticed mid-conversation next to a tent. The guy mentioned was pitching the tent. Then they talked, and she glanced back at me while I was filming the crash scene. We made eye contact but I broke it since I moved to get to a different angle on the crash. They went into the tent, and I saw them using a light inside of it. I thought she didn't have one. I finished filming and went not too far from where police were parked to check my shots. Then I went back to my car and locked the doors. From how she was talking, I think she might have been under the influence of meth. She spoke fast and stuttered a bit. After I finished editing my video, I left. This all happened at about 2 a.m. When I was 17, I started working at my local grocery store. About three weeks in, I got transferred from the front end to produce. My first week in produce, I met all the people in my department and all was going well. One night on my second week in produce, I was closing alone when this girl comes in. My back turned to her, I hear. You're new. When did you start? I turn around and we start to have a conversation while I put the last few things from my cart on the shelf. I had about ten minutes left on my shift and was going to go downstairs to crush my boxes. But this girl continued to talk and took no social cues that I was trying to leave. I finally get tired of listening to her talk and start to pull my cart through the produce section as she slowly follows still talking. Eventually we get to the doors and I start to make my way through and she comes in right after me. I explain that unfortunately she can't come this way and she needs to go check out as our store was closing pretty soon. She says bye and leaves, and I thought it was odd, but maybe she's just a bit weird. I crush my boxes and go home, and I don't think about it. Two days later, I'm closing again, and the same thing happens. This time, she asks for my number. I explain that I don't have a phone this time, hence why I had a job so I could get one. Okay, well, would you want to hang out when you get off? She asks. I felt a bit odd at this point, as I thought she was just a bit odd and just looking for friends. I tell her maybe next time, as my mom was picking me up. So every night I worked, she would come in and just pick up one grapefruit, and then walk around, basically acting like she was either on the phone or pretending to shop, and then casually stop by me. It got old really quick, to the point where I would hide in the hallway and watch her till she left. Eventually, other people in my store heard about her, and rumors went around that she was stalking me. The deli manager explained that she and her boyfriend also had been stalked by her for a number of months. 
Eventually she stopped coming by at night as I was hiding when she did come. A few weeks go by and I'd just gotten off of work and my friends were meeting me to hang out after. So I head out to the parking lot and meet up with them when my stalker comes out of nowhere and hugs me. I haven't seen you at work in so long, she says. Oh, yeah. They, uh, switched my hours so now I don't have to work late anymore. Well, one thing leads to another, and my female friend starts to talk to her and basically invites her to hang out with us. She jumps on the opportunity, and so we all start walking back to my friend's house to hang out in the backyard, as it was a nice summer's night. The night wasn't bad. We all just hung out, and I kind of avoided the stalker, while my female friend kept her entertained. The night came on pretty fast, and eventually it was 1am. My friend's mom came out and told us we had to leave. Me and my two male friends and stalker head out, and were waiting at the bus stop that my friend needed to catch when stalker explained she can't go home this late, and that she needed to stay over. So I beg my other friend to stay with me, which he agrees. We wait for the bus to pick up my other friend, then head to my house. Things got really weird at this point. So basically, the stalker refused to sleep on my floor and only wanted to sleep in bed with me. I eventually gave up and said okay, and my friend slept on the floor. So I'm laying in bed, and this girl stands up and just takes off her bra and shirt, and then her pants and gets in bed with me. I at first was pretty dumbfounded and didn't know what to do, so I acted like I didn't notice, and then she started trying to kiss me and have me grope her. I lightly push her off and explain I'm trying to sleep. She wouldn't take the hint and kept insisting that we cuddle. I was getting fed up, and so eventually I wake up my friend. Nathan, you asleep? I ask. He sits up. No. Why? He responds. So she covers up with the blanket so he doesn't see her naked, and then I basically explain that I wanted to go for a walk, and so I have Nathan leave the room and get her dressed so we could go for a walk. On our way out, I tell Nathan to get his bike. We walk outside at this point, and it's almost 3.30am. Me and Nathan walking with our bikes, and the girl beside us. I'm thinking of ways we can get rid of this girl. At first, I suggest me and Nathan just take a walk in the alley and go pee, but she says she's scared and wants to go with us. Eventually, while walking and talking, she says how she was on track in high school. Oh, you run track? I bet that you can't beat us to the end of the block, I say. At this point, Nathan looks at me and smirks as he knows we're about to ditch this girl. For it being 3.30am, this girl was really excited to go sprinting. She takes off running for the end of the block, and we take off in the opposite direction, back towards my house. We rush back inside and hide our bikes in my house instead of the porch, and go to the living room, making sure not to turn on any of the lights. We sit there, talking about how crazy this chick is, when she starts banging on my door. We stayed quiet for what seemed like two or three hours of her just banging on the door, talking to herself, banging on the door, then more talking to herself. Eventually we heard the downstairs door open and watch her leave. So the next few days I go to work and I don't see her, which is good. Then about a week later she comes in and completely ignores me. She gets her random grapefruit and pretends to shop while me and a co-worker are talking. She's wearing a backpack this time, and she was right in between me and my co-worker. She turns to walk away, and her backpack touches something on my flat cart. She turns around and starts screaming, and throws all the boxes off my cart. She starts saying I grabbed her, and she wants to talk to the manager, and so my co-worker tells me to go downstairs and just get away from the situation. I head downstairs and sit in the break room. About ten minutes later, I'm called up to the hallway where my manager is talking to the girl. I see from the door that she leaves and he comes into the hallway to talk to me. So this girl says that you grabbed her and shoved her and that you were swearing at her, he says to me. 
I explain what happened to the manager. He goes off and finds my co-worker and then comes back to me after talking to him. My manager comes in and looks at me. You need to sleep with her already. We kind of chuckle and then he tells me not to worry about it, that she's just crazy. Eventually she left me alone, but then my girlfriend started working with me and the girl would come in to see me and my girlfriend and then go to her line to check out. She was always really rude to my girlfriend. Eventually she stopped coming around altogether and from the looks of it, she's married to some 50 year old man on Facebook and she's about 24. I was stalked by a guest in my student accommodation. I'm 19 years old and living far from home in a studio room. I'm often up late and last week I was just doing some laundry at around 11 p.m. ish. I saw a man sitting in the lobby. I saw him around a bit at night, but I didn't think much of it. I'm in the laundry room. I just put my clothes in the dryer and I hear the laundry room door beeping. It meant someone was coming in. There was the man, standing there with no clothes to wash, just staring at me. I maneuvered around him and headed to the lifts. He quickly followed me and cornered me and asked for my Snapchat. I was tired and just wanted to get back to my room, so I stupidly gave it to him. I figured he'd message and try to flirt. I'd say, I have a boyfriend, sorry if you thought this was anything else, and that would be the end of it. Anyway, he starts messaging me. It's kind of normal, then he starts saying weird stuff like, I saw you a month ago and I was impressed. I've been visiting a friend and staying here. I've been watching you. I notice that you come out mostly at night. He told me that he was only visiting for five more days. Then it gets worse. He says, I love you, I can't help it. And then I say I have a boyfriend. He says, I only want you. And continues to completely ignore that. He asks to come to my room and I said no. Then he wanted a hug. He asked me if I'd lived alone and had done anything with anyone. He kept saying he loved me and that I was perfect for him, that I impressed him. At that point, I recorded all the messages on Snapchat, spoke to him a bit more to gather evidence so I could take it to reception in the morning. He's been watching me for a month. I got my guy friend, who lives on the second floor, to walk me down to the laundry room. We sat in the student lounge area, and my friend calmed me down. I was shaking with adrenaline and fear. We saw him around the laundry room again looking for me, but luckily I'd already picked it up. I run back to my room and my friend says that I can stay in his room, but I say it's okay, I'll just lock my door. It's about 1am and I hear someone outside my room trying to get in. I ask my friend if he's outside my room and he said no. So I just froze. I didn't want to make a sound. I felt sick to my stomach and helpless. Eventually it stopped, and whoever it was went away. In the morning, I reported this to reception, and then went to stay a few days with my boyfriend. Then after, went to London to visit a friend. And last night was the first time I'd spent in my room since this happened. I'm very paranoid now. Sadly, I should probably be used to this. It's not the first time I've been harassed. One guy tried to kiss me in a club by grabbing my head, and a bunch of other things have happened that I won't go into detail. But anyway, I'm terrified to go outside my room after dark. I'm constantly looking over my shoulder and feeling paranoid. About 12 years ago, I moved into a new rental house with my partner and our kids. We were the first people to live in it as renters, so the estate agent arranged for a company to send a tradesman around to install new smoke detectors that met their standards. A receptionist from the installation company called my number and made an appointment. 
I got a follow-up reminder text the day prior to the appointment. All pretty standard stuff. I was home with my two youngest children when the installation guy arrived. The kids were playing in the lounge room while I let him in. He was a big bear of a guy who was really over-the-top friendly from the get-go. The kind of friendly that's so full-on it weirds you out. But he was being polite, so I just went with it. So anyway, he starts walking around the house, looking way too interested in everything. He's poking his head into the kid's bedroom and touching my decor items and books, and generally being really nosy. He asks where the master bedroom is. I walk in and lead him to the room, and he follows me in. So we're chatting, and it's still all friendly, but I feel really uncomfortable and that I feel like I want to leave. But I can't because he's blocking the path to the door. He's just staring at me really intensely and smiling and chatting, but not seeming like he had any intentions of doing any work. I'm starting to get a really creepy vibe off of him. He's asking me a lot of personal questions, and his friendliness is feeling very intrusive and borderline seedy. So I try to hurry things up. I asked him if he needed to install something in the room, and he told me, no, the detectors will go in the hallway and lounge room, yet he stands his ground in my bedroom. At this point, my kids came running into the doorway, asking for lollies from the treat jar. That kind of broke the weirdness of the situation. The guy kind of hovers, but I stand there, obviously waiting for him to leave first before I start to exit. He leaves the room and stands in the hallway. I follow him out and give the kids a lolly each. The guy starts getting really over-familiar with me, joking around and calling me mom and asking if he can have a lolly too. It was bizarre behavior for a stranger, so I just kind of laughed awkwardly and ignored his request. Then he asks if he can use the toilet. I show him where it is and take the kids back to the lounge room to play. In this house, the toilet is a standalone fixture in a tiny room. It's not in the bathroom. It has a sliding door which opens into an area just off the living areas. It's completely visible from the lounge room where I was with my children. The guy opens the sliding door, stands in front of the toilet, and starts to pee with the door open. All the while, he's whistling loudly or trying to chat to me over his shoulder. I was really really uncomfortable by this, and I was starting to feel panicky. Like, why is this guy almost exposing himself? The guy comes out, doesn't wash his hands, and asks if he can have a glass of water. He's already been in my house for about 20 minutes and done nothing. I just want him to install the detectors and leave. So I get him a glass of water and tell him that I expect company really soon and start veering the conversation towards getting the detectors in. He gets to work, installs the detectors within 10 minutes, and eventually I get him out the door, though he did seem really reluctant to leave. I was so relieved and freaked out when he left that I immediately went around the house and locked all the windows and doors. About an hour later, my mom arrived. I was still feeling really weird about the whole experience, so I kind of yanked her in the door. After she got the whole, what on earth are you doing thing out of her system, she says to me, have you got a repairman coming? There's a guy in a van sitting out in front of the house. No kidding, the guy had been sitting out front for over an hour. I thought that was it, but a month later I got a series of text messages asking me to confirm I'd be home for an appointment to have the smoke detectors checked. I didn't want to deal with it. So I ignored the first few. Then my partner called the number to ask what was going on. Sure enough, the guy answers. It's his personal number. The guy talks to my partner for a few minutes. He's really friendly and says he doesn't know anything about an appointment. That there must be some kind of mistake. Then he asks, Oh, is this Nikki's number? And proceeds to ask my partner more questions about me that I looked familiar, where I work and what is my surname, that kind of thing. My partner told him, in no uncertain terms, that if we ever heard from him again, 
he wouldn't like the consequences. I guess it worked, because I never did hear from him again. I'm currently a female in my 20s. When I was in 7th and 8th grade, I had a stalker. The first time I saw him, I was rocking around the block in the summer. He drove past me in his really nice, big pickup truck. He waved at me, and having lived in a small midwestern town, I didn't really think anything of it, so I smiled and waved back. He then proceeded to circle back around the block and try to lure me into his truck, telling me, you are too pretty to be walking. I can give you a ride home. I wasted absolutely no time and sprinted three houses down inside my home. My mom asked me why I was breathing so hard and being nervous to tell her what really happened, I just told her I simply went on a jog. Now, I assume he saw me run into my house that day and in turn knew where I live now. For the whole summer when I was home alone, he would park his pickup truck in our driveway for hours, and I mean hours. He would then begin to knock on the front door and look through the window for about 10 to 20 minutes at a time, and then he would just sit in his truck after I wouldn't answer. In order to hide from him so he couldn't see me through the front window and the huge living room windows, I would always run upstairs as I would hear him pulling up. One day, my friend and I went to a middle school boys basketball tournament. At the end of the game, we were sitting outside of the school, waiting for a mom to come pick us up, as they wanted everyone out of the school in order to begin cleaning the gym. Then the truck pulls up, and this time, he asks if my friend and I need a ride home. We promptly said no, and the janitor saw all this go down. As my stalker continued to try and persuade us into getting a ride from him, the janitor opened the door and led us back into the school and he asked us if we knew that guy. We said no, of course, and that was the last of that. The same friend and I also saw him multiple times at the local grocery store, parked there as we were walking in, and he was still parked there as we left, every single time. The last time I saw him, I was in the parking lot of the local grocery store, and for some reason I never told my parents, sisters, or any of my friends about this. I'm absolutely baffled by this, and I have no idea why I pushed it so far back into my memory. I also have no idea why I never told anyone. After my dream I had about him a couple of nights ago, it's all I can think about now. So, guy in the really nice red F-150 lifted pickup truck, who also had a rat tail, let's not meet again. Not even in my dreams. Back in 2013, I just started an education. And after the first school period, I had to go out and find an internship to be able to progress. But at that time, it proved to be almost impossible to get one. So while I was looking, I decided to take another job just to make sure we had food on the table. After searching for a while, I found out a friend of my fiancé's family had his own handicap bus company. And he needed someone to cover the night shift, since it was a bus that had to be on call at least 22 hours a day. Seeing that I'm quite the night owl, I immediately told him I'd be happy to take the job. And after I got the needed license, I was hired. The job was pretty basic. Pick up people and drop them off where they needed to go. And sometimes use a machine to get wheelchairs up or down some stairs. And when there were no trips, I drove to a designated area and did whatever while waiting. I quickly found a truck stop in the area where I could park and catch some Z's while waiting. There was a gas station where I could buy coffee in the early hours of the shift. 
and on the other side of the gas station's parking lot, on the opposite side of the truck stop, there was a run-down restaurant with a motel connected to it. To not disturb the sleeping truckers, if I got a trip in the middle of the night, I usually parked on the restaurant side. After parking there every night for a while, I noticed one particular room had a lot of people come and go. In the beginning, I thought nothing of it. But then on one night, at the end of summer, while I was half asleep with the window slightly open, I suddenly heard yelling coming from the motel, and a guy came tumbling out of the room and started running. A few seconds later, a big guy came running after him with something in his hand. I couldn't make out what it was. I thought it was none of my business and went back to my half-sleeping waiting stage. Not much time passed and my phone went off. I had a trip an hour's drive away, so I turned on the bus and was leaving the parking lot when I saw the big guy coming round the corner. The rest of the night I had back-to-back -back trips, so I didn't park until I got home. The day after, I didn't get a return to home zone until 2 or 3 a.m. When I arrived at the parking lot, the area where I used to park had fist-sized rocks strewn all over the place. Not connecting the dots at the time, I just parked a few spots over and started waiting. I fell asleep pretty fast, but was jerked back into reality when a car right in front of my bus honked its horn, flashed the high beams, and revved its engine. I thought it was some idiot who noticed me sleeping, and found it funny trying to make me shit myself. So I jumped out of the bus about to tell him to piss off. But instead of driving off or stopping, the driver made the start brake thing with the car, indicating that I was the one who should go. And then I connected the dots. Not wanting to seem like a pushover, I stood still and stared at the car. Not that I could actually see anything with the high beams almost blinding me, and after what seemed like a really long time, but must not have been more than 30 seconds, the car drove off. After that, I decided to park near the trunks from then on. A month or so passed, and nothing had happened since the car episode. I figured that nothing more would happen if I just kept parking by the trucks. Then one night, I had a long 12-hour shift on a Sunday, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I didn't have time to eat dinner before work that day, and during the first half of my shift, I had back-to-back -back trips with no time to eat. So when I got a return to home zone, I parked in the far end of the almost empty truck stop and got ready to eat my now very late dinner that my fiancé packed for me. I wanted to watch some TV on my phone while eating, so I sat with my back against the driver's side door and got comfy. While turning my back to the door, I had accidentally hit the door lock with my elbow, but that was my luck. As I was sitting there scrolling Netflix on my phone, I suddenly felt the bus rock and heard the clack of the door handle behind me smack back in position. I quickly turned and saw a dude with a hood over his head, quickly crouching and proceeding to lay on the ground and crawling under the bus with a big-ass kitchen knife in his right hand. I quickly got up and made sure the other two doors were locked and then I looked in all directions to see if I could spot him. He was still under the bus, and I was sure as hell not jumping out this time, since the knife made his intentions pretty clear. I turned on the engine, turned on the spots on the back of the bus, and looked around to see if it had scared him off. And luckily for me, it did. 
I saw him run off and into a bushy wooded area at the end of the truck stop. I never parked at that truck stop again after that night, and I made sure all the doors were locked every time I was parked. Just a quick backstory. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and everyone who's lived there knows it's very busy and noisy all day. The Ripta buses, traffic, businesses everywhere. But at night, it gets very quiet and very eerie sometimes. This story is about an incident that happened to me when I was 15, and I got my first job at McDonald's. This gives me chills every time I think about it. I was 15 and just got hired at McDonald's down the street from where I live. It was perfect because I could get to and from work without worrying about getting a ride from my parents. While working there, I met some kids my age that I became close with. Unfortunately, they weren't the greatest of kids. They were very rebellious. They would clown around at work, act disrespectful to customers. Typical 90s punks. I slowly started to become like them. I began disrespecting my parents, which was totally not like me, but I was always the nerd that didn't have many friends, so I wanted to fit in. One night, at around 10pm, I finished watching Monday Night Raw and went downstairs to grab something to eat. I opened the fridge and heard my dad's footsteps. He wore those slippers that tap loudly on tile floor. Chris, I've asked you all day to take out the trash. They come tomorrow, so do it now he said to me. Normally, I would have taken it out the first time he asked me, but now that I was getting older and becoming a smartass, I didn't think it should be my responsibility anymore. I work now and go to school. You take it out, I replied. My dad's eyes got wide as I'd never spoken to him this way before. He leaned in and said softly, as long as you live here, you will help out. Now take out the trash or leave. I called his bluff, and rather than just simply taking out the trash, I rebelled like the dumb teen I was. Fine, I'll leave if you're gonna kick me out for that. Don't bother looking for me. I'm done living in this stupid house, I said as I opened the door and slammed it. I walked towards McDonald's to see if any of my friends were there, and they weren't just the maintenance guy finishing up the cleaning. Of course, of all nights, it was raining, so I had to find somewhere to go and stay dry. There was a bridge with an overpass a little ways down the street, so I started walking towards it. The whole time, I'm regretting what I did and wished I just took out the damn trash. I finally got to the bridge and I climbed up the hill to the little section in the corner to stay out of view. I remember in school learning to go here in case of a tornado, so I knew I was safe. I patiently and stubbornly waited, assuming that my parents would call the cops, which in my mind would show me that they cared. An hour goes by, nothing. No sirens, no cars were even on the road. I was getting pretty cold, but I promised myself I would not give in. I crossed my arms over my legs and fell asleep. I woke up violently from a semi wailing on his horn over the overpass. I looked all around confused. How long was I out for? I looked towards McDonald's and saw an old man in a gray suit sitting at the bus stop. It was weird. He was sitting still facing forward. I assumed it must be like 5am since he was waiting for the bus. I stood up very upset that my parents never tried to find me, and I began walking to the bus stop. Now, I'm a very outgoing person, and I trust my gut. As I walked closer to the old guy, I didn't get any negative vibe as I approached him. He slowly turned his head and looked at me and smiled. Not a creepy or uncomfortable smile, a genuine, peaceful smile. I smiled back and decided instead of going home, maybe I can vent to this guy and get some advice. I asked him if he minded if I sat down. He smiled again and gestured towards the seat. 
Is everything okay? He said with concern. Yeah, I just ran away from home. My parents don't respect me anymore and how much I do all day, I said. I began telling him the story, and I noticed as time went by, he was becoming more and more anxious, and his smile began turning into a frown. He began to start breathing loud, and he cut me off dead sentence and said, You need to go home now, with a stern voice. I was confused. I figured maybe his bus was coming soon, and he wanted to say that before he left. I looked down in frustration, because that's not what I wanted to hear. Suddenly, I felt a strong grasp on my arm. He grabbed me and looked me dead in my eyes. His eyes were terrifying at this point. Bloodshot and wide, and I was shaking in fear, totally thrown off guard by his complete switch in his persona. He was literally shaking like he was afraid of something. He kept looking down the street and then back into my eyes. You need to go home now. He screamed at me. At this point, the guy was starting to scare me, so I stood up and nodded, and he let go of my arm. Nervously, I started walking back to my house. I figured my mom was already up making coffee, so my plan of sneaking back into the house and hiding in the basement was not going to happen. Just to see if she'd be up, I looked at my watch. It was 1.30 a.m. My heart stopped and my throat became dry. Why was that man at the bus stop at 1.30 a.m. when the buses aren't running? I turned back toward him to look at him. He was gone. Now I'm scared, confused, and I needed to get home. I used my spare key to get into the house. I opened the door quietly, and everyone was asleep. I slowly opened the basement door and made my way downstairs to the storage area in the back. I buried myself under bags of clothes so they wouldn't find me. I figured I could get some sleep. The image of that guy kept popping in my head, and I was so freaked out. It just made no sense. Just then, I heard loud sirens passing by, and not just one. It was multiple bursts of sirens coming every ten seconds or so. I smiled, thinking I've won. My parents called the police to look for me. My plan worked, and now I'll make them worry until morning and regret kicking me out. I made myself a little bed and covered myself up to stay hidden and fell asleep. I woke up to hearing my mother sobbing upstairs. I looked outside the little basement window and saw daylight, so I figured I'd go upstairs and get my apology. I opened the basement door and walked into the kitchen. My mother was sitting at the dining room table with her head in her arms. She immediately looked up at me and gasped. She stood up and ran over to me and hugged me so tight. I thought you were dead. She muffled into my jacket. I slowly pulled away and looked at her, confused. Why would you think that? I asked. What she said next sent chills throughout my entire body. She said that last night at around 1.40 a.m., a drunk driver crashed into the bus stop in front of the McDonald's. It was completely destroyed. I started breathing heavy and realized that man saved my life. If he didn't tell me to leave when he did, I would have been sitting there and would have been killed. So many emotions were running through me, I didn't know how to handle it. So I just hugged my mother and immediately began to cry. I apologized and realized that I missed the old me. I almost got myself killed from my own stubborn stupidity. I dropped those friends and got into a new crowd at school. And from that point on, any time the trash was full, I just took it out. I don't know who or what was at the bus stop, but thank you for saving my life. Whether it was just a lucky coincidence or right place right time kind of thing, but no matter what, all I know is if it wasn't for him telling me to go home, I would have been sitting on that bench for the rest of the night. Almost a year ago, I was an opener at a resort, clocking in before 5am each day. 
The resort is located inside an affluent neighborhood in a very wealthy town slash suburb. Employees had to park in one of two parking lots at either end of the property, and the lot I chose was adjacent to a long and windy road outside the resort, which led to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. I'd arrive one morning, per usual, and put the car into park with my headlights still on. The lights in the lot weren't ever on in the morning since no one else really showed up before 6am when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Save for security, I was one of the first employees to arrive on the property each morning and was usually completely alone in this particular parking lot at this time. This morning didn't seem any different. I had my hand literally at my keys, my brain in the process to turn off my car, when I noticed a young girl, maybe like 14 or 15 years old, come scampering through the span of the trees that separates the resort from the outside road. She was directly in front of my car, and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black, she looked like she was in high school, had long blonde hair, and was wearing a jacket with pajamas maybe. It was like she just walked out of a house. One thing about her that bothered me was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car, but she was visually giggling at something I wasn't aware of or could see, and it was so unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her, as if someone else were waiting there away from the headlights. She then waved at me like it were a normal gesture at this time, and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. This all happened in a matter of seconds, and I wasn't really sure what was even happening besides my anxiety spiking. I know I simultaneously yanked the aux from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off, while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger side. I realized because I didn't turn my car off, it had stayed locked. She began pounding on the window and I was screaming on the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside like this was some type of game as if I were a silly friend for not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped pounding and trying to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I disappointed her, and she started to walk away from my car, back the way she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of the view of my headlights. This whole encounter confused me almost as much as it scared me, most people I told the story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs, but that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out-of-touch teenager whose parents need a firmer grip on her. My first thought was possibly human trafficking, but I'm not sure if that would fit the scenario as I'm not the most well-versed with the subject. I told someone when I made it to LP, but they didn't seem to care much. I didn't call the police, and I regret that. I'll never get out of my brain, though, how fucking off the feeling was, watching a stranger, seemingly alone, pop out from the trees in the darkness, laughing, and then try to violently enter your car in an empty parking lot. I do think the possibility of someone else being present the whole time is a lot more scary, and I wonder who else was there. And where exactly? I live in a small town in northern Italy, a valley between our typical old mountains, so just behind my home lots of hikes start. I've always lived here and I like mountains, plus I am getting in shape so the terrain is ideal especially because I'm really familiar with it. So, last summer I was walking my usual route when I thought I would have a short hike before sunset, and I set off. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Italian ground, but there aren't the big spaces and long distances typical of the US I imagine. I was with my dog, a well-trained Spitz. 
Nice company with good instincts that I trust. He's a working dog more than a pet, despite his size. So we took a path and started making our way up. It was nice and relaxed, but it wasn't as active as we didn't have too much light time left. I just figured that if the light went low, I'd just turn around and head home. No chances of getting lost. The woods immediately engulf us. It's pretty dense, but it's normal. Not even 15 minutes of walking, and I'm paralyzed with this overwhelming sense of dread. The woods are completely silent. My skin crawls just thinking about it. Even my dog stops anxious. I just couldn't understand what was scaring me so much. In the sudden silence, I couldn't move a muscle. I've read The Gift of Fear, and the only time I didn't listen to my gut, I lost my spleen in an accident. So wide-eyed and hyper-alert, I forced myself to move and noped out of there. It was like my brain was screaming, If you stay here, you'll die. Walking back, I couldn't stop the urge to continuously look behind me. At some point, I was practically running, and I kept thinking that if I sprained an ankle there, I would die. The dog seemed relieved when we had turned back, and he kept looking behind too. When we finally made it out of the woods and back on the road, I felt a wave of relief and ran all the way back home from the adrenaline I had. To this day, I don't know what happened, and I haven't gone back. My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent tens of thousands of hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts or BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the US exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail, mule deer, wild boar, and whatever else. Since 2016, when we get the time off, I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We're both mid-twenties, and it was 2019. This was probably my fifth time hunting the area and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us, and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails basically the middle of nowhere. The nearest main road is probably 8 to 10 miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We spent the next day scouting and tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked, then ate, had some beers and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet so I think it was around 4.30 a.m. We sat in my tent and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds. Different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. 
I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time, I felt like I could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth every single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd it was still the middle of the night, and we were so far removed from any nearby communities or industry to hear and experience this occurrence. A few decades ago, I was relaxing at the edge of a very public lake, trying to get in on the evening bite. There were about a dozen other anglers taking up my usual spot, so I'd moved maybe 50 feet away, finding a steep path to the shoreline that was about 8 foot down, with vegetation on both sides that was thick enough that if I leaned against the bank from the rock I was perched on, I could pretend I was alone. So, I'm sitting and chilling and waiting for a hungry trout when I hear someone at the top of the path coming down. I figure it's another angler, but no. It's some random guy who sits near the top of the path and starts chatting. Then he scoots down closer to me. At first I don't mind. He had a distinctive voice and we had a pleasant conversation. That is until he started talking about how he was coming down from a high of some kind and was looking for sex. Then he asked if he could join me on my rock. I was done with him, so I reeled in to check my bait as I said absolutely not. He asked again. I picked up my fillet knife to cut my line and change a lure. I could have used my nail clippers, but the knife made him stop asking. I ignored him after that, and he seemed to get the message and headed back up the trail. He goes away, and I start to relax again when I hear his voice. He's standing about ten feet away at the top of the path when he says, Well... I guess I'll just do it by myself up here. Now I'm pissed off. I get that way when I get scared. Knowing I'm within earshot of other people fishing, I start yelling at him to put his dick away and get out before I call the cops. No one did a damn thing. Even as I started climbing the steep path to end this shit, he must have finished because he casually got into his car and drove off before I could reach the top and get a plate number. I was too unsettled to go back fishing, so I grabbed my gear and went home to tell my husband about it. At his suggestion, I called the police and gave them the description of this person, vehicle, and voice. But of course, there was nothing they could do at that point. My anxiety was having a field day with all of this, but I figured that was the end of things. No. A couple weeks later, I'm at the grocery store with my young children when I hear that voice. You know the expression, blood ran cold. It really felt as if I had been chilled to the bone. I grabbed the kids and left the cart, rushed out to the car, and waited for him to come out. I saw him get into his vehicle and I wrote the plate number down. The wee ones were starting to freak out because I was freaking out, realizing that this guy lived in my neighborhood. I called the cops again, giving them the new information. They said they'd check things out. They called a week later to tell me the guy they talked to had a short buzz cut, so he didn't resemble my description, although they did agree the voice could have been the same. I started shopping elsewhere, but I've never felt comfortable enough to enjoy my solo evening fishing at that lake again. So, to the tweaking loser who ruined my favorite pastime, let's not meet again anywhere.
So I live with my dog and my roommate in a one-story duplex. I've got a fenced-off yard, and the private part where my car is parked is accessible via an alleyway with a bunch of massive signs saying, No parking. No trespassing. Private property. I was sitting in my bedroom playing games, and it was around 12 to 1 a.m. And my dog, sitting on the couch in the living room, started barking at something outside. Every now and then she does this because there's a squirrel or a bush moved or something. So I get up to shush her. I open the blinds on the window to say, See, there's nothing outside. But there actually is something outside. So through the fence I can see the headlights of a car idling in front of my house and lights start bobbing around outside and what appears to be people walking around in front of my yard by my car with flashlights looking around in the middle of the night. So, full disclosure, I was kind of stoned. I'm not sure if it's a reverse effect because my sober self is an anxiety-ridden creature living under a blanket who's too scared to send an email to my manager. But my high self is Fred from Scooby-Doo. As in, come on gang, let's solve the mystery. So I decide I'll just go out there and investigate. I let my dog out, walk my pajama-wearing, unarmed brawless self out there, and step outside and go to the gate. I can now see it's a well-dressed woman and man in a nice newer model car. They're walking around the front yard with flashlights. I say, hey, this is private property. Can you please leave? The woman kind of seems startled and says, Sorry, our car broke down. The man gets in the car. She walks around, gets back in the car. They talk for a while, and I'm not sure what else to do. I just kind of stand there watching for what felt like ages, but was probably only a minute or two. They seem to be deciding what to do. He starts the car back up. They pull out proceed to drive around, pull into the public street, and park behind my neighbor's car instead. I decide to sit outside from my porch and kind of watch them to make sure they didn't get out and start investigating the neighbor's car instead. They never popped the hood of their car or got out, which seemed to run fine when they drove off. I never saw them come back. For a couple of notes, there are loads of spots you can park in and around my neighborhood that would not be clearly private property, with better lighting, and you don't need to be near other cars. But to get where my car is parked, you've got to drive down an alley and look for that spot. Like, my friends have trouble finding it. The car was a newer model sports car. I'm not saying those cars can't ever break down, but I guess I'd be less suspect if they rolled up in a Geo Metro, Mini Cooper, an old Subaru hatchback or something, and were like, Oh man, my shitty car broke down. When I sobered up the next day, I was like, I either just politely told some car thieves to stop attempting a robbery on me, and they did, or I made someone's shitty night even shittier. I mean, they weren't dressed for car theft, or like a party or date night. The woman was in heels, and I don't know shit about cars. Maybe they really did just break down and the spot next to my car was the closest they could find. Then I spooked them even more by taking neighborhood watch a little too far. I guess if I parked in the neighborhood and a half-naked woman and her possibly big scary dog came outside to stare at me in the middle of the night, I'd get out of there too. I didn't report it, but I did inform the neighbors about what happened. My car was broken into a month or two later. I had some non-valuable stuff taken another night, but I slept through it and have no way of knowing if it was the same people or not. So about 12 years ago, I was 9 years old. I was home alone with my 12-year-old brother. We were supposed to go to my aunt's house to have lunch and wait for my mother there. We got up at 10.30 a.m. I took a shower, then my brother did. After that, we were both in the bathroom brushing our teeth and finishing up. 
when we heard someone knock on our door. Since every time someone knocked at our door, they turned out to be a salesman or Jehovah's Witness, we kind of waited for them to go away. After a couple of minutes, I went to see if they were still outside through the window, and no one was there. What a relief. We continued getting ready when we saw a shadow go by through the bathroom window, which was kind of like a small square of frosted glass. We waited and watched just in case it was a bird flying by. When a hand hit it, clear as day. We got scared. We didn't know what to do. My brother had his cell phone, so we immediately called the police. While it was ringing, we heard a loud bang at the door. Someone was brute forcing it. I don't know if they were kicking or ramming it but he was one of the most frightening things I've ever heard. My brother told me to lock the bathroom door, so I did. It took five bangs before the perpetrator finally bashed the door open. The police answered. I remember the exact thing my brother said. He was whispering. His voice could be barely heard. Hello, there's someone in our house. I think they're stealing. Then a pause. We're at 1249 Maple Street. Another pause. I'm with my little brother locked in our bathroom. Please hurry. While all that, I was sitting against the wall, hugging my knees. It was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences ever. I could hear the man going through all of our stuff, emptying stands, going up and down the stairs, opening cabinets. He even broke a few cups and plates. Then I heard the sound my cell phone does when it turns off, and I remembered leaving it on the kitchen table. I felt so stupid for leaving it there. Things continued for a couple of minutes when we heard him trying to open the door to the bathroom. My brother got a hold of a big metal rod we had lying around there. The man started kicking the door. Who's there? The man screamed. We said nothing. Another kick. Then another. I felt I was about to have an anxiety attack. My chest started to ache. I had chills and was really hot. I tried to remain calm, but it was just too much. After that, he stopped. We heard the door opening, and then silence. We waited for almost ten minutes before going out of the bathroom. The living room was a total mess. Lots of papers and books on the floor. The cabinets were open cups and plates on the floor. In our mother's bedroom, the nightstand and the closet were open. Everything inside them was all over the place. Upstairs in our room, it was the same thing. In about five minutes, the man was able to go through everything we had and left a total mess. After that, my brother called my mom, and she ordered us to go to my aunt's ASAP, so we did. When we got there, I was a little more relaxed. My aunt was waiting with us with ice cream, probably because my mom had told her everything, and she wanted to calm us down a bit. We got back home at about 5 o'clock. My mom told her boss she had a home emergency, so she left early. She tidied up the house, cleaned up, and left everything the way it was before so we could be relaxed. I really appreciate her effort and my aunts to calm us down and do everything, so we didn't have to think about it. According to my mom, the police got to our house after she arrived, at about three, four hours after the incident. She explained everything but because of a lack of evidence, nothing could be done. 
The man was never caught, and honestly, I don't think they even tried to search for him. The next few days, my mom was home with us. Now I tell the story is a funny anecdote. Luckily, no one was hurt, and he only took useless stuff. But at the time, I was really scared. To a nine-year-old, an experience like that can have serious repercussions. I'm lucky it never came to that, and I got over that after a couple of weeks. So yeah, that is my story. My parents had just picked me up from softball practice. I was pretty tired. Before going home, my parents stopped by a grocery store to shop for dinner. Since I was tired, I asked to stay in the car to take a nap. They agreed and let me since they would be fast. I quickly drifted off to sleep, lying back in the back seat of our little car. At some point, I woke up, kind of groggy but with a tingling sensation. A chill ran down my spine. At first I couldn't figure out why, because I was still half asleep and a little out of it. I sat up and just started to look around, but didn't find anything off. Then I heard a tapping noise. There was no one around, but the tapping continued. In my half-awake state, I realized the tapping sound was coming from behind me, through the closed car window. I turned my head to see a creepy woman staring at me intensely. She was a drugged out homeless woman. She was grinning at me with her yellow and brown rotting teeth. Her translucent pale yellowish skin was warped and stretched out and burned in some places as if being passed out in the sun for too long. Her arms were long and skinny but also veiny, bruised and probably infected from the puncture marks running up and down both of her arms. Her skin looked a bit green, and pus was oozing and trickling out. Her nails were discolored, long, jagged, and broken. Dirty, blonde hair was all over the place, badly cut and greasy. The most unnerving part, though, was she was heavily pregnant. Never mind that she was also barefoot and had white clothes stained with dried vomit in the front, and had obviously soiled herself on more than one occasion. Her outfit, looking back, kind of reminded me of a cult-like uniform. Anyway, this woman freaked me out. Where did she come from? What did she want with me? And who knows how long she'd been there watching me sleep. I wish I had done something, like honk the car horn or start screaming, but the thing was, I was so scared I couldn't do anything. Thank God the doors were locked, because she did try to open all of them. I don't know what she was thinking or planning to do, but it certainly was unnerving. She got frustrated, pounded on the windows, and was making low, animal-like grunts signaling her frustration at being unable to get into the car. Thank God by some miracle, she eventually gave up and just wandered off. I told my parents what happened as soon as they came back. The lady was gone at this point. My parents got upset at me about what had happened and just told me to go shopping with them next time. Safe to say, years later, I've never ran into nor seen that woman again. And I hope to keep it that way. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening, and thank you to my channel members and patrons. Killian's Place April James Arterburn Jen Joy Handout Pegasus Genesis Karen Keating 
V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.